So we've seen a lot of sessions in simulation. We talked about a lot of things, about the history, about you know, people's experience, their lives. We had you know, very interesting dive-ins yesterday from NASA where we looked at how to create content, mm -hmm. make sure content was accurate and, and was uh, processed in a very optimized way. Uh, we had a conversation this morning with four experts of the geospatial domain where we you know, discovered that there's no magic recipe. There's no one-size-fits-all solution <coughs> when you're building content for simulation. There's a lot of different topics that we've been talking about. Uh, there's, uh, there's a company that is kind of interesting in our field of simulation that you probably all know called CAE. We'll show you a little video after for those of you who never heard about CAE. And even for those of you who heard about CAE, you've probably seen a little bit of that, but not the full spectrum. A um, couple of years ago, when I started with Epic Games, that's my turn to tell a story here. A couple of years ago, when I started with Epic Games, um, I've been um, visiting several players of the community, and one of them was CAE. I arrived there and met that uh, gentleman, Marc Saint-Hilaire, who will be our speaker today, um, CAE's CTO. And Marc, um, you know, I approached Marc very naively. I worked for CAE for a long time in my life. So I approached Marc and told him, hey, I have this thing called uh, Unreal Engine. You're interested? <laughs> so he looked at me and was like, yeah, yeah, well, then show me. So I showed him. He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a game engine, right? Yeah, you do games. Uh, I mean, that's great. That's great what you do. It's fast, it's beautiful, but it's small environment, and you can't go bigger than you know, X kilometers by X kilometers. That's very detailed, that's nice, but you don't have either the right mm -hmm. finesse in your calculation. You're oversimplifying everything. I mean, it's 32 bits. We need double precision, and that's, that's not working for us. <laughs> so I was very sad. <laughs> I mean, he was very nice with me. He was very, you know, gentle, explaining me. I was very sad, so I went to another simulation company. I told them, hey, uh, we have this Unreal Engine here that's pretty interesting. You're interested? And they told me the exact same thing. <laughs> After a couple of them, I was really, really embarrassed. And we realized that we had a trend just in front of us. Right? We had a trend that could allow us to progress and to make our technology evolve. And that's why today in Unreal Engine 5, you have this double precision capability. We broke that glass ceiling that we had because we were stimulated by the right influence and the right conversations with the right people who are actually doing the work in simulation for a very long time and can share their expertise with us. That's this type of partnership. That's this type of you know, um, conjunction of work and, and, and collaborations that we're looking for with the simulation community, right? You all know things that we don't know, and we, you all have expertise that we don't have, and, and that's by learning from you that we augment the capacity of our game engine. So today, we'll uh, play that little video, but I'll, I'll leave that stage. I'll leave it to, uh, to Mark, who will come and talk to us about uh, CAE and their evolution when it comes to their use of game engines, uh, what they're doing today and what they are foreseeing to do in the future in the next generation of the solution that they are building. Thank you. 
everybody. Please welcome on stage Marc Saint-Hilaire. Thank you. It's too late, okay? Good afternoon. The microphone is on? Yes. Thank you, Sebastien, for those kind words. Thank you for Henriel for giving me this window to you know, present CA today and talk about what, what's happening under the hood. I mean, the, the subject of the presentation you know, is learning how to fly. And it, as Sebastien said, it, it's, it's just showing what's really happening uh, you know, between CA and Unreal. Uh, before I go there, let me start with a brief overview of CA. You know. Our mission is very simple, essentially. It's to lead at the frontier of digital immersion for those moments that matter. We train, we prepare people for those moments. Whether you're a pilot, you know, experiencing an engine failure going down the runway at the most critical speed. Whether you're a soldier deployed on a critical mission and the stakes are high, the environment is complicated, or you're a doctor and you're performing a very complicated procedure for your time, first time in your career, this is what we do. We prepare people for those moments. You know, we, we, over the years, we went from customer not knowing we were doing training, we were doing into the training business, to being today the global leader in terms of training. Delivering last year over a million training hours in aviation. When the accountant look at the company, this is the picture they, they see. A Canadian high technology global leader. $3.4 billion revenue on a yearly basis, 13,000 employees working around the globe in over 200 sites. If you uh, look at the industry we're, we're playing into, you know, there's been a lot of uh, changes and evolution and disruption over the year. Training for aviation started more than, you know, 70 years ago, and back then it was done on the aircraft itself. You know, pilots were training on the aircraft. There was a big pivotal moment in the 70s where most of the training switched from live, real aircraft to a virtual environment in a flight, sim uh, in a flight simulator. So from live to virtual training, you know, big pivotal moment, and from that moment there's been a constant quest towards improving the fidelity, improving the immersiveness of the training device. It started on a runway, you know, providing runway markings. It went to the airport, and now it's in the areas around the airport. And the higher the immersiveness or the quality of the simulator or the, of the senior projecting, the better experience for the pilot, the more they believe they're actually flying into an aircraft. This year we're celebrating our 75th anniversary, you know, and for me it's very interesting because I look at the technology journey mostly across those years. And uh, essentially, you know, we have back in the mid 80s defined the training standard for the aviation industry by the flight simulator. And that standard today is still very much relevant. It's still the standard for training pilots in the flight simulator. We pivoted in the early 2000s from a uh, doing complicated device, essentially flight simulator or a project, to a product, you know, a high volume, high production product. We're typically pumping up more than 100 flight simulator a year these days. And we did that pivot by leveraging the global supply chain of COTS element, commercial off-the-shelf electronic, commercial off-the-shelf computers, and motion system projectors. Somewhere into the 2015, 2015, Switch the complete company from a product company to a service, a training service provider. Today, more than 75% of the revenue of the company are coming from delivering training service. And when we did the pivot, we did the double pivot, I call. Not only we pivoted towards training, but we pivoted towards training delivered in a digital way. It was a massive embrace of the cloud digital technology into that period to reach to the customer, interface to the customer, but also to track the learning journey you know, digitally. Somewhere in 2015 to 18, we went and introduced a number of augmented reality, mixed reality, virtual reality training solutions. Some of them won awards. We won a, you know, the Microsoft developer awards on the, uh, uh, what you saw in the video, the HoloLens uh, for doctors at uh, you know, all the pathologies. And today, there's a clear focus on large-scale synthetic environment. This is where we are today. Uh, doing flight simulator, of course, you know, we're a leader in the visual solution. And our journey started many years ago. And 
you can see the early days of visual systems for flight simulator. Picture on the right is a mock-up, a giant sized mock-up of all the area around an airport. And on top of that mock-up, there's a little camera, which is uh, flown or, uh, you know, uh, commanded by a robot arm. And the robot arm is servo link to the point of view of the pilot, dynamically calculated in real time. The, the image seen by the camera is rendered into the field of view of the pilots on the old-fashioned cathode ray tube. Thank God that things have moved. You can appreciate the scale, the scale of that thing. There's a man, you know, at the bottom of the right picture you could see next to the ro robot arm. It gives you an idea of the scale of those things. Just to illuminate the mock-up, back then it required more than 200 kilowatts of energy to illuminate. I mean, today a full-flight simulator will consume no more than 15. So technology has progressed a lot in terms of visual system, and that's why we're here today, you know. Game engines like Unreal, they've been entering the training industry for the last 10 years. I can clearly uh, remember uh, at the ITSEC annual show, which is occurring every year at the uh, end of November, back into the 2008, 2009, you could see the first gaming solutions appeared. And back then, you know, you know you, what we were looking is, you know, Training solutions, not for flying, but from some, what, what we call back then, partial task trainers or lower level tr task trainers. So we were looking at first person shooter, tactical training. And, and you know, the, what, what Game Engine brought to the industry was very disruptive back then because in into a single package, you had the turnkey. You know, you had the development environment, you had the tool, you had the means to distribute your own solution. And you even had an access to an ecosystem of content and people who wanted to help you. It, it really disrupts uh, the, you know, the making of those training solutions. Uh, I mean, if you go to ITSEC today, you'll see Unreal has got its own boot, and they're a significant player. So you know, it, they went from being under the hood of some of the training solutions to today they have a major boot and a major presence at, uh, in our industry, the training industry. Now, we have some challenges, and some of the challenges Seb has alluded to earlier, you know, the challenge that four or five years ago, we were exchanging with him and say, okay, what you got is good, but this is what we're dealing with. You know, the world that we're flying, you know, is, is huge, essentially. Uh, and uh, the XYZ coordinates, which is built in into your software, won't cut it for us, you know. Uh, Earth has got a curvature. There's a horizon line in front of you. There's a line of sight to what you can see, what you cannot see. The navigation system requires a polar coordinate to work and connect things properly. That's one of the challenges we're dealing with. The second challenge we're dealing with is the size of the displays. The displays we're dealing with, you've got a dome fighter here that you can see. It's life size. You know, you're completely immersed into those things. And those, those big displays with multi-projectors, they're quite good, but they have a nasty tendency of magnifying any defect. Any anomalies, it will show up in your face and it's gonna make you say, okay, something is not right. You know, it'll make you disconnect from the experience. You know? So we are therefore compelled to deliver a very, very high standard of image stability and coherence between all the details. It needs to make sense. The third challenge that we're facing is the, the system delays, the, the network latencies, you know, all, all of that. You know. And to illustrate that challenge, you know, flying an aircraft, it's a bit like closing the loop, a control loop by a human, where you know, he's, he's essentially applying a force on a control yoke, and he's sensing through his body sensor, his eyes are telling him where he is and where he's going, his inner ears is telling you his acceleration, his inertial, is touch is going to tell you the force, you know. And, and that loop is very delicate, you know. Uh, any latency, any delay in that loop will make you feel incorrect and will make you disconnect from the experience. It, it, it is so critical that the regulators are prescribing limits, you know, into the FAA and the ASA are prescribing a 90 millisecond top limit for the system delays and the latency. Now, that's the overall loop. You know, not the visual only. 
You know, so you can imagine, you know, you're sensing a force from a, you know, a, a sensor, you're converting to digital, you're traveling into a network, you're entering a computer, central computer, you're calculating the next step for the future, what you should be, and you're outputting that next step through a network, it goes to the motion system, it goes to the queuing forces, and it goes to the visual system, which calculates a new scene to be rendered and displayed. That, that's quite of a long chain for that loop to close. Uh, so when you put all the pieces together, other than 90, typically you leave about 50 for the visual system, which is uh, still a huge chunk, but it, it is a complicated thing. So we have, within the simulator itself, challenges, and from simulator to simulator, you know, the network, the communication between simulator to simulator, which is essential. I'm training on a fighter simulator, I shoot down on something, and my colleague is, you know, my wingman on the other, on the other simulator, we're both in a joint scenario, and we want to see at the same time that I shot down something. You know, so there's a network latency, which is just as critical as the inner simulator loop. Now, there are moments in the life of a technology company that I call major technology pivot points. You know, it happens. You know, years after you develop and commercialize successfully a very complicated technology solution. You see it coming, you know, you start to realize that some of the big building blocks in your solution, they're not gonna carry you to the future. You know, they, they're gonna stop you, they're gonna prevent you to move forward, you know. And, and this is when you start, you, you're facing the difficult decisions. Say, okay, I need to burn some ship, ships and I need to move forward. At CA, we're, we're quite comfortable with that process. You know, we have gone through a number of those transitions very successfully. This is one of them. You know, the visual rendering computer at the beginning of the journey, we were making it ourselves, essentially. You know, those are printed circuit board that were custom designed and custom built at CA, you know, featuring tons of ASIC and FPGA, all assembled together, all in link in together. You know, a very successful uh, design. And at one point, somewhere around the 2000, we pivoted to a new design with four cards, you know, custom made cards, with, with GPU, uh, you know, uh, doing all the heavy lifting of calculation, and the cards were hardware linked together to, you know, to hack like as a single. And later on, somewhere in the 2008, you know, we pivoted to two commercial off the shelf. You know, today we're NVIDIA G GPU, their software interlock, and we've been riding on that journey, you know, uh, of, uh, power, you know, visual calculation ever since. This is another example of technology pivot points or technology changes, you know, the process of creating the visual itself, you know. It started, uh, you know, early, early, you know, uh, you know, the visual content creator working from paper maps and aerial photography. And what we are today, and I think you saw a presentation this morning, but Max R, you know, we're dealing with uh, artificial intelligence extracting 3D feature out of almost real time satellite imagery. You know, this is the journey. I won't go through each one of the steps except one. There was a key moment in 2016 where there was a pivot from, you know, closed proprietary standard format to describe the GIS. Each company had its own format, and the format was closely aligned to the IG. And it was that, that proprietary nature was preventing interoperability, simulator sim to simulator. And there was a big demand from the customer. We want to start interconnecting the simulator easily. There was a big demand in 2016. The Open Geospatial Consortium adopted the, adopted the CDB format as a simulation GIS format to ensure uh, interoperability. And very quickly after, the U.S. National Geospatial Agency, it's the, the agency in the U.S. which is in charge of curating all the geospatial content and distributing it to the other armed body, adopted it and put it on a disser, you know, and declared, I'm going to curate the content into this format. That was a pivotal moment. I, I don't think I'm going to do justice to the, the, the speech and the video that was this morning there, but essentially, you know, I'm back into uh, AI Extract. This is what it looks like. You know, the satellite imagery is with this, and after the AI robot has processed it, you see buildings, you see vegetation, you see roads, all extracted out of the ground into simulation-ready content. This is transformative because, 
We used to be, we has to, used to have armies of people creating the content at the airport, creating the cities. It was very labor intensive, you know, people looking at maps, looking at pictures, and creating those 3D objects inside the database. Now this is done automatically, essentially. Okay, I spoke about the OGC. Now, you know, now that we share a common view about the background in the industry, let me talk about the latest technology pivot point that uh, we're going through at CA. It's called the new CA visual rendering software. It's called Prodigy. All right. It's, you know, we started, as I said, uh, visual in the early days. We were on FPGA and ASIC. And back then, you know, the, the, the product at the end, the combination of the hardware and the software, was called MaxView. Now, and it was close to bare metal programming. Back then, you know, at the peak, the heydays of its performance, we were rendering 6,000 polygons. The polygons, you know, was the lingo back in those days, but essentially little triangles, irregular triangles all stitched together and you put a texture onto it. And uh, we reached 6,000 polygons. I give you a sort of an acceptable image. And we were really proud of that. When we pivoted into the GPU, into the 2000, the product, you know, was called Tropos. And you can imagine the pivot on the hardware, but there's a pivot on the software. We went from FPGA programming to essentially a software stack based onto the OpenGL standards and services there. And from that moment, nobody was talking about polygons. We were starting to talk about the content being displayed. How much content featured, you know, the quality of the image. And was closely associated with the roadmap of the, GP, uh, the GPU. The, you know, the GPU got stronger on a yearly basis, and we were able to ride and put more content displayed onto the screen. Today, I'm very happy, and it was announced by CA's public information, you know, we're pivoting to the Unreal Engine as the software stack of our next visual solution. And, and that's what I'm going to be talking about in this presentation. You know, why are we making this pivot? You know, uh, you know, the game engines have been investing significantly for a long time in visual rendering, and they have moved the state of the art to a level which is beyond what we do today. All right. So given the posture of our friends of Unreal, a uh, posture of, yes, for the collaborators, we're going to share the code and we're going to work together, it doesn't make sense for me and for CA to reinvent the wheel and solve problems which have been solved already. You know, it, it makes sense to take you know, what's available and move forward. I, I just look at, uh, this is a little animation, and it shows you, I mean, it's a bit exaggerated. I've selected the sequence on purpose to illustrate uh, the effect there. But this type of visual performance, where you see the reflection of the clouds into the puddles of water, into the uh, puddles of water on the runway, is unachievable by what we do today. You know? and, and that's you know, one of the, amongst all the reason, one of the key reasons, you know, the quality of the visual solution, why we're pivoting to this software solution. Granted, we've been, like many others, we've been doing training solution with Game Engine for many years, okay? And as I said earlier, Game Engine came as a turnkey development, you know, with the distribution package, the, you know, the, the tools, and the, the large ecosystem. Uh, you know, and I really think this was disruptive to our industry, but I, I'm not here to talk about that. You know, we have done for the years into the lower, lower what we call lower level, uh, Lower, and it's not derogatory by any means, a lower level training devices there. We've been using game engines to create training solutions for those devices where the level of immersiveness is not as high as what we got into the top end solution, you know, the top end where you get the, the big displays there. You know, so we're not looking uh, in the same thing. But today I'm here to talk about Unreal into those devices, facing the challenges of putting Unreal into the visual solutions of those devices, essentially. And doing so, we're facing unique challenges. Some of the challenges that Unreal has solved already, but some of the challenges that needs, still need to be solved. And we're working jointly, our specialists are working jointly with the Unreal specialists. And I'll be sharing with you a couple of those key challenges that we are working today. You know, aliasing, you know, and I'll be talking about what aliasing is, the round earth, the 3D round earth, the large world data paging capability, the real-time performance, and the multi-channel synchronization. By no means an exhaustive list. You know, if I would have listened to the engineering team, you know, the page would have been full. 
but the major ones. Thank the, you. <laughs> the major ones, which are on the right in front of us. All right. Now, what gives me comfort and assurance that we're going to come to a solution very quickly is the metaverse, you know, a phenomenon that really started about more than a year ago. And it's trying to achieve similar goals to what we're doing in the simulation, but for new application, essentially a persistent, connected, large world, you know, that anyone can interact, uh, subscribe and leave and come and go. When you look at the challenge the metaverse is facing, it's the same thing as us. So we're going to be helping each other here. You know, what we're going to work, you know, pushing the boundaries of this is going to help. And I'm sure we're going to get a heavy tailwind from the metaverse people. Aliasing, this is what it looks like. You know, if I animate the thing, you see those little lights flickering into the corner. Well, these are not lights. These, these are, you know, lines which are painted on a runway, and they should not flicker. They should be rock solid, you know, and uh, it, it's a deal breaker in the simulation industry. When customer sees this, they walk away from the simulator, and they say, you know, you fix this, and we'll be back when you, you, you've uh, showed it to us, essentially. We, in the simulation industry, we understand this phenomenon very well, and we've fixed it before. And uh, I'm very convinced that working together, it'll be fixed on the roadmap of Unreal very quickly. This is going to be a slam dunk. You know. A second challenge, you know, as I've been talking about the round earth, the large round earth. You know, the training sessions that we do with pilots involve flights over a very long distance, just like real flight, anywhere around the world. So large areas, which do require 64 bits precision for the coordinates, supporting viewing angle at large distance, you know, which sometimes creates artifact of shadowing or light reflections, which are unique for those point of view. The whole, you know, whole world terrain representation consumed terabytes, if not petabytes of data. It's very routine for us to deliver a simulator with more than 100 terabytes of terrain data. So, Good news is Unreal 5, April of 2022, has released the first step into that journey, the 64-bit georeferencing plugging. You know, it, it, it's still it's, it's great. There's still a gap with uh, the simulation world into the uh, into the top end. There, there's still more, still work to be done in tiling and paging. There's a bit of z-axis which is left here and there, and some of the feature, you know, the feature or the functions. You know, uh, are not at the same level, but you know, I'm very confident all of that is going to be native. I see Albin here. You know, he's nodding. Yeah, all of those will be solved native into the next version of Unreal. Large display that we do on simulator, typically anywhere between three to twenty channels. It gives you an idea. The frame updates between all the channels need to be synchronized. You know, the effect as uh, clouds and wave and characters moving and animation must transition from one pro projector to the other. You see those deers existing in one frame, one tread of calculation? They're crossing seamlessly. The head is crossing the boundary zone. You know, that type of feature works most of the time, but not all around in, in Unreal yet. So there's a bit of work here still to be done. But nevertheless, a uh, great progress. And last, the famous, the real-time performance. Uh, you know, Here's the world of real-time with all the tricks, the concept, the choices that we made to ensure stability and low latency. And all of those choices that we made, they come as a cruel compromise to the tricks required to create a spectacular image. The, the length of the rendering pipeline the deferred lighting calculation, the garbage collecting schemes are all traded off against determinism and stability. Our choice in the simulation industry in the past were pushed dramatically one way, bias towards stability at the expense of image richness. I'm very convinced that the two teams together are going to combine and come with a new happy medium, which is going to satisfy both. Now, we've looked fairly low. Now, I'd like to take you looking up there. You know, uh, there's another benefit to this journey. You know, the new markets, new application for us in, this, in the simulation industry that this type of visual system is going to open up to. All right. 
I mean, you probably heard about the EV tall market. Today, there are more than 600 vehicles under development. You know, I'm convinced. You know, at least half a dozen are going to make it through. Up to make it through is being qualified and carrying passengers. You know, you know, if you look at those vehicle, if you look at those um, those, those uh, vehicle, I mean, they uh, they fly in dense urban environments. Uh, you know, so they, they require an awful lot of GIS content to be displayed. Oh, and uh, all, all of that needs to come at a price point which makes sense into the economic model of those devices. I mean, if the vehicle costs below a million dollars, the training solution needs to cost, you know, something. And the visual solution and the content creation needs to tie up. All of that needs to be buttoned up. And this is where it makes sense, the game engine, the ecosystem, the satellite imagery. The second large phenomenon is those large synthetic environments, you know, for defense application for civil security, for, for environmental understanding of large phenomena. The, the new big challenge that the Earth is facing, you know, understanding the mega trends, you know, aggregating information almost in real time coming from several sources and making sense out of it in the real time or planning into the future. I'm very pleased to announce that we publicly launched a new training device which has been purposely designed for the eVTOL market. The device is as disruptive as the, uh, the, the vehicle themselves. It's the visual is a, um, a mixed reality display. The visual content and rendering software is based on the Unreal uh, rendering engine. It's got a few technology first for the industry, like uh, cloud computing, edge device architecture, and it's loaded into the richness of the terrain with uh, complicated urban weather microenvironment rich air traffic. I mean, it's a pretty sexy device. The, the other thing is, the, as I said earlier, the big technology push towards single large synthetic environment. You know, for the last three years, we've been heavily involved with NATO, with some of the countries to create those large synthetic environments. Some are in the defense, some are in the civil security. You can imagine all the conflict in Ukraine today, NATO wanting to understand and to prepare for scenarios of the new hybrid warfare. Uh, warfare is being conducted on several fronts between space, communication denial, logistics denial. You know. This is a scenario in London where there's a cyber attack on the electricity grid, and there's all sorts of you know, unfolding of the scenario with the people, you know, the human congregating on Trafalgar Square. So we've we constructed those scenarios. We don't do this alone. I mean, the challenge is so big that we're not going to solve it alone. You know, we've assembled a partnership. Unreal is part of the partnership. Black Shark, as you saw this morning. I think I saw the folks from ADN, Mimi and Craig are here, you know, with the fantastic software which let you scale the solution on the cloud, the proportion which are unimaginable. Cesium that lets you consume the content at the point of need with the device that you got on your hand. You know, great partnership. In summary, you know, I thank you. I, I, I'm convinced that the whole industry is going to leap forward with uh, this capability. And there's a couple of challenges ahead of us, but definitely solvable. I, I have not seen anything that I'm scared of, and I'm, I'm very confident we're going to use it. We're going to benefit from a huge tailwind coming from the metaverse uh, application. I just saw a couple of applications this morning into the music and entertainment industry, you know, where they're facing exactly the same challenge. So we're all betting against the same thing, but we're going to move that boundary further. I thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.